Hello and welcome to Let's Code an Indie Game episode 22. This is the series where we learn the tools and techniques needed to get started with indie game development. In this episode we are going to continue working on our punch code and hopefully finish it at least for uh, this visit uh, to that part of the code base. Uh, but first let's remind ourselves where we got to last time. Okay so if we take a look at our punch class we can see that um, our punches are just entities, like everything else in our game that moves around or interacts. Um, it is an entity. When we create our punches, they play uh, the punch sound, which seems pretty sensible. Um, and also when we create our punches, we create a timer. And the timer is a piece of code we wrote last time. That's a class we introduced in our last episode. We uh, create this timer, and what the timer does is it calls done on our punch entity after six um, updates in game time and then we finally add that timer to our punch and the result is when we uh, throw a punch in our game it will stick around for um, sort of six ticks, six cycles of updates and then it will disappear. Now our, our punches don't currently interact with anything else in the game and that's what we are going to fix in this episode. Um, we're also going to make some uh, modifications to the timer, which was suggested by SPH in the comments. So a big thank you to SPH for commenting and asking questions. Very helpful. Okay, so what do we want our punch to do when it uh, collides with another entity? Well, we want that entity to take some damage. Um, and because we're trying to follow object-oriented programming, we're going to use the principle of tell, don't ask. And what that means is it's generally better to tell an object to do something than it is to ask information about the state of that object. And so, um, we are going to come into our entity and we're going to add a new instance function called take damage. So what we're doing is we are telling our entity um, class that we want it to take some damage. And we'll pass in uh, we need self as the first argument because it is a instance method and we'll also pass in the damage we want to uh, we want this entity to take and then in here we'll say if self dot vulnerable then self dot HP equals self dot HP minus oops, minus damage and it would also make sense to say if uh, self.hp is less than or equal to zero uh, then we want to call self done and uh, done is the function which takes an entity out of the game uh, or in this case kills it. So nice and simple to start with and let's make sure we actually initialize those um, those variables when we create our class so we need on our instance to say vulnerable and we'll start off with all entities being vulnerable and uh, HP and let's just start off with uh, 5 HP to begin with. And eventually these are properties we probably want to pass in when we create our entity but uh, just to move us on we don't need to do that right now. Okay so let's uh, just run the game and make sure we haven't broken anything good everything is still working which is uh, what we would expect at this point so let's go back into our punch um, class and inside of here or I guess it's a module rather than a class our punch module and inside of here let's create a um, local function called collision And this is the function we're going to pass into our punch entity to be executed whenever there is a collision. Function end. And let's just remind ourselves what our collision functions take. So if we look at our entity class and take a look at collision check, we see that if there's a collision function, we call it with... Um, self because it's an instance method then the entity and then the game so here we can say self the entity we're colliding with and also um, 
the game state object as well. And the first thing we we need to do when there's a collision is uh, let's just check that it's not the player because we don't want the player at the moment to be able to punch themselves. So we'll say if game dot player um, is not equal. That's how you do a not equals in Lua to um, entity. Then we'll go ahead and run the rest of the collision code. Um, if it is, then we'll just uh, we just the if yeah slow down. Um, if it is equal to the player, then the if statement just won't run, and uh, we'll just fall out of the method. So everything should be fine. Okay, so now we can call our new take damage function. And uh, to start with, let's just do one damage. Nice and simple. And we need to pass this in. So um, there's a couple of arguments we're not passing in at the moment. Uh, one is speed, which can just be zero. Uh, one is a movement function or a movement strategy, which can just be nil. And then we need the collision. Um, and let's see what happens. Aha, attempt to call method take damage a nil value. So this is probably because on our entity, yep, we need to add instance dot take damage. Um, so the take damage method needs to be available on the instances of our entities in order for us to call it. So that should fix that. Okay, so um, progress. So one thing to notice, I'll just go into the next room so that we can uh, we can see that again. Uh, currently, all of the enemies die in one punch, and um, because they have 5 HP, we would expect them to die in 5 punches. So this is because the collision lasts for, um, I think, for about 6 frames of moment. And six frames is enough to, or is more than enough to run the collision function multiple times and reduce the HP down to well below zero. So what we need to do is make sure that our entities uh, can no longer take damage after they've been punched, at least for a short amount of time. And we can use our timer to do that. So inside of take damage, we can say uh, let's just add it onto this if statement. So, if the HP of the entity is reduced to uh, less than or equal to zero, then the entity is finished. Um, otherwise, so we'll just throw in an else here. Otherwise, we want to say entity dot vulnerable equals false, so they can no longer take damage. Um, but then, if we just did this, they would be uh, they would no longer take damage forever. So let's also add a timer, and uh, this is where we need to pull in the timer module into our entity module. So we can just say local timer equals require source dot logic dot timer. There we go. Where are we? Back down to here. Add timer, timer.create. Um, and let's say that for, I don't know, 10 updates after, 10 updates after an entity has been hit, uh, we want them to be invulnerable. So we'll throw in a timer here, which takes a function to run after the timer is finished. Um, it takes itself and um, the entity. So in this case, um, just the entity, I guess, and the game. And we just want to say after 10 frames, entity dot vulnerable equals true again. So after 10 frames, the entity can take damage again. So uh, let's see what that's like. So one, oops, nope, that's still not, uh, still not doing its thing. Ah, self.vulnerable, not entity.vulnerable. So, uh, yes, we always want to be operating on the instance here. So, try one more time. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. One, two, three, four, five. Great. So, 
that uh, that works, but it's not really obvious that um, entities are invulnerable. So let's add in some iframes as well. Uh, so iframes or the iframe effect, I guess, uh, is from when in older video games when um, the bad guys or the good guys actually or any of the characters used to flash when they couldn't take damage. Um, I stands for invincibility. So it's this idea that after you take damage you have a certain number of invincibility frames where you can't take damage anymore. Um, and let's, because we're going for a retro feel, let's, uh, let's use that here to show the player that anything that is flashing isn't taking or can't be hit for the moment. So let's say self.iframes equals true down here. And when um, at the end of the timer we just want to turn iframes off, so we'll say self, or oh, sorry, ent dot iframes equals false. And I guess we could actually just use, uh, we'll use ent here, although I think we could just use self because of the way scoping works. Um, but maybe it's slightly clearer to use ent. So let's initialize our iframes um, property int iframes equals false to start with. And now we need a way of making our entities flash easily. And the way um, the way I'm going to do that is to add a method to the game state. Um, and we'll just call this method uh, modulate. I think local modulate equals function end and we need self because we want it to be an instance method. And what we want to do here is return the number of updates um, that we've had since the start of the game divided by uh, Let's just say divided by two. Actually here we can just do uh, modulated by two and we want to know if that is equal to zero or not. Um, and what this will do is half of the time this will return true and half of the time this will return false um, in sort of a true false true false true false fashion. Uh, so let's just make sure we keep track of the updates. So when we create our game state number of updates is going to be zero and then whenever we update our game state we're just going to say self.updates equals self.updates plus one and the reason we're doing this is it just gives us a nice sort of a signal generator that we can use to make things flash on and off. So now inside of our entity when we update. Um, we're going to say if self dot iframes and game modulate then so this is if the iframes are activated and um, modulate returns true then we want to say self dot visible equals false. Um, else self dot visible equals true end and uh, we also need a self dot visible so let's add that property as well so we're adding a lot of properties to our um, entity class um, which is not surprising because it does an awful lot uh, self dot visible needs to be true to start with but this is probably a sign that we need to at some point um, in the future come back and break our entity class down into smaller classes because it's just getting it's getting too big it's responsible for too many things uh, and it mean and that just means it's harder to think about it uh, you generally want your classes to do one thing well rather than um, lots and lots of things not so well so in a future episode we'll probably come back and slice this class up into a couple of smaller classes. Uh, but for now we just want to get our punches working. So where did we get to? Uh, so we have self.visible which starts out as true. And then when our iframes are activated 
up here we um, switch self.visible to be false or true based on whether the or based on what the game modulates says and then finally when we actually draw our entity we want to say if um, self.visible then do the drawing otherwise uh, don't basically uh, so we don't need an else here because um, yeah we only want to draw if um, self is visible let's see uh, if this works Okay, attempt to call method modulate a nil value, so this probably means most of our errors come from the fact that uh, I forget to add methods onto instances, and indeed I've done it again, modulate equals modulate. And there we go. So now um, our entities flash when they're invulnerable and uh, go back to being solid when they are uh, not invulnerable. Excellent. Okay, so now before we finish up, let's update our timer. And um, this really comes from the comments. Someone pointed out that um, our timer should be using the DT value in our game. Uh, we covered DT a while ago now, so just a quick refresher. Uh, DT or delta time, uh, let's find where we set it, equals DT, is just a value which gets passed in from the love framework itself. So if we take a look at um, main.lua, you can see when we um, update the game, the framework gives us this DT value. And what that value is, is the time the time taken since the last update. And so what we can use this to do is to smooth out a lot of the um, movement and timing in our game, because if the game took slightly longer to update, then we um, move the player slightly further or we increase the timer slightly more. If the game took a shorter amount of time to update, we increase the timer slightly less. Um, and this just means things are a lot smoother uh, because not every update will take the same amount of time because of things like garbage collection and um, just stuff going on in the background of the PC or just stuff going on in our game. So what does that look like? Well, what we want to do is inside of our timer, um, when we keep track of the ticks, we actually want to say self.ticks equals one times game.dt. And uh, this isn't really uh, ticks anymore, this is now time. So let's uh, let's change this to be time. Just so we don't confuse ourselves later. Self.time, self.time, inst.time, and inst. Uh, we'll leave tick um, as the name of the function, but everything else should be uh, time. And the other thing uh, we're going to do is it's I find it useful to think about the timers in terms of um, how many updates or how many yeah how many updates of the game or how many frames of animation do we want um, the timer to run for. So let's add a function um, onto our timer module. Uh, so we'll just do timer dot uh, and we'll call this, sure, let's call this ticks, um, which will convert between sort of the average frame rate or the average time it takes to update the game uh, for one frame and, um, and seconds. So if we take in a time in terms of, uh, let's call it frames, what we want to return is uh, frames times 1 over 60 because uh, the, the default value for our updates is to try and run um, 60 times a second. So if we take the number of frames, um, each frame we're in an ideal world will be uh, 1 over 60 seconds long. If we times the number of frames we want by 1 over 60 seconds, we get the time we, uh, we hope it will take to do the update, and then our, the DT value will take care of everything else. So let's just uh, make sure we now use this because if we run the game now, 
what we'll find is our timer just runs for a really really long time because we've switched between um, incrementing it by pretty big values and incrementing it by small values because dt is normally a very small number so this just means wherever we use a timer so in here for instance we're also going to say timer.ticks 6 and this will give us the time in actual time so I want to do this here inside our entity we also have a timer for when we take damage so let's say timer.ticks 10 and also in our player I think uh, we have a timer for when we actually throw a punch yes we do so let's see uh, if this works We are, our timer is still running for a very long time so uh, ah yes this is the other fix we need to make because um, dt is unpredictable we can no longer use self.time equals self.duration we need to do um, if self.time is greater than or equal to self.duration because we just want to capture the tick where the timer goes above the duration now not because there probably won't be a tick where the time is exactly equal to the duration There we go. And finally, let's just tweak or two more things actually. So for this episode, um, let's tweak the iframe time. Let's make it twice as long. There, that feels a bit nicer. Right, and the other thing I'm going to do is in the last episode we introduced um, this value called interrupt movement for uh, interrupting the movement but we didn't set a default value for it um, inside of our entity which um, you can do but just in because this class is getting so big I want to make sure everything has a default value uh, just because if I want to find out all of the properties on an entity the one place to do that should be in the entity.create method um, I don't want to go hunting through the code base to find all of the properties I add on the fly so uh, let's just say instance interrupt movement equals false let's check I didn't add it nope there we go Right, so um, I'm going to finish here for this episode. I hope uh, you're enjoying the series and that you found it useful. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do next episode, something which isn't punching because I think we've finished that, um, that bit for now. We will come back to it uh, later. We'll come back to most things later because you know, the way I like to develop is to do just enough to get it working, move on to the next thing, then come back and do a big loop and improve things based on based on how I'm feeling, based on the feedback I get and how it looks. So um, please join me next time for the next episode. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.